Hi, everyone. Glad you could join us for today's session, Writing CSS Selectors the Easy Way, with expert guest speaker, Corinna Pip. So between her work as test automation lead at Splend, her own personal testing projects, as well as speaking engagement at international conferences, I'm happy Corinna found the time to do this session with us. Before we officially kick off, I want to take a moment and tell you five things about our speaker that you probably don't know. So the first one is that Corinna is a certified Scrum master and, an, and is an expert in test automation and agile testing methodologies and techniques. Two, Corinna is a savvy coder and an experienced programmer fluent in many programming languages and tools, systems, and platforms. Number three, She's an amateur cartoonist. On her blog, I'm a Little Tester, you can find her testing experiences literally drawn out, as well as her blog posts about QA testing and automation. Number four, Corinna lives in Romania. And five, Corinna is a Test Automation University instructor, and her course on IntelliJ for Testers is due in September, so keep, out, keep an eye out for that. And if you're not already, I strongly recommend following her on Twitter or connecting with her on LinkedIn. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Corinna, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. Um, this will be, I hope, a very useful uh, session for all of you who are writing Selenium tests and who need to create the CSS selectors for your CSS uh, for your Selenium tests. So thank you again for joining me. I will uh, walk you through some of my experience in creating these selectors and what I've learned during my career about how to easily write these selectors and how to have them short and not brittle as uh, it was the case before. So I will just jump into the subject of CSS selectors and I will not discuss, for example, why we are not using or why we should or should not use XPath selectors or anything else. I will just focus on CSS selectors for today's session. Why do we need CSS selectors in the first place? Well, when we're writing Selenium tests, we need to interact with pages. We need to click on some buttons or we need to type some text in a field. In order to do that, we need a handle to the HTML elements that we want to interact with. So if I want to click on a button, I need an HTML element that I can refer to. I need the handle to that element in my tests so that I can send a command via Selenium to that particular element I want to interact with. We want to create these handles in such a way as to uniquely identify the HTML elements that we want to work with. And we also want to find the shortest path that will get us to that particular HTML element. Therefore, we want the shortest selector that we can write. In order to do this, my approach is to create a page object class where I store all of the CSS selectors that I'm creating for my pages into web element variables or lists of web element variables. For that, I'm using the at find by annotation, which is used for storing the result of a selector to what you specify, either a web element or a list of web elements. As I said, I'm using the page object class, which means that all of these elements that I defined, all of the uh, variables into which I store these elements, are available across a large number of tests. Every test that needs a particular page can access it and can use it uh, in, their, in the test. I will show you just uh, in a few slides. So the whole approach that I'm using is an annotation, then I define a selector, and I store the result of that selector to a variable. What does a page object class that I'm using look like? So in this example here, I have a class called base, basic page. And in this basic page, you can notice that I have several at find by entries. Each of them have a CSS selector defined. And you define this by saying CSS equals. Then we will type in what is the CSS selector. And we are going to go over these in a few slides. And then we're going to store the result 
of this at find by operation to a web element in this case or a list of web elements as you can see on the lower side of the screen. So this is how we will create our variables that will be used for interacting with the page. Once I defined, let's say, the element with ID that I have here, I can say element with ID dot click, for example. So this is the page object class. What about the test class? In order to start running my test, the first thing I need to do is to open a browser. In this example here, which is also available in GitHub, and I will also provide a link to, I have a browser getter class that I will not show here, where I have an operation, actually a method called get Chrome driver, which I'm using to start my browser. So before I do anything else, in my at before all annotated method from JUnit, I will just initialize the browser and I will store the browser into a web driver variable called driver. So in my before all method, first I open the browser by saying driver, driver equals browser getter dot get Chrome driver. So I'm just opening the browser. Then I want to use the page object class that I created initially, which was called basic page. Before I do that, I need to initialize that class and I need to call a page factory dot init elements method who, to whom I need to specify which is the driver. So where did I store the browser session? Oops, sorry. Where did I store the browser session? And what is the page object class that I will work with? So I need to specify the name of the page object class that I created earlier. After I have done this setup, I am able to use all of these variables that I created initially in my page object class. So now I can actually interact with the elements that I have here. So this is the part of the setup uh, regarding the test. This is how I create the page object class and this is how I create a test and how I have access to the page object class. How do I create my web elements? This is where I will start talking about the CSS selectors. So there are several select selector types that are available by default. We have the ID, we have the class, we have the tag, and we have the attribute. Each HTML element has a particular structure. Each HTML element starts with a tag name. So for a button, the tag name will be button. For a link, the tag name will be A. And for an image, the tag name will be IMG. Of course, there are many other uh, HTML elements that I didn't mention here. Then each element can have an attribute and a value or just an attribute. Having only an attribute means that that attribute is a Boolean one. But we will focus more on these attributes that actually have a value. Some of these attributes are general and can be stored or attached to any web element. And these are, amongst others, an ID and a class. So a button, a link, an image, anything can have an ID or a class. There are some other particular and specific attributes that are used only by specific HTML elements, like in the case of a link, an href attribute, which specifies if you click on the link, what will be the URL that opens, or a width or a height attribute, which are specific to images, which of course tell you which is the height and which is the width of the uh, image as you see it in your web page. So it's, it's important to remember that on each HTML element, we can have attributes who have certain values. The first and most interesting and important attribute that we can work with in order to define CSS selectors is the ID. Hopefully, we have a lot of IDs on our pages. So the easiest way to define our CSS selectors will be based on a ID. In theory, an ID should be unique on a page. I'm saying in theory because there is absolutely no kind of constraint in this regard. So a developer can choose to create an ID 
which is unique and assign it to an element or they can choose to use the same ID on several elements on the same page. In order to identify the ID of an element, of course, we need to inspect the page. So we will use some kind of um, browser tool where we can inspect a page. Maybe we have Chrome developer tools or something equivalent in another browser. By inspecting the page, we can check whether the element we want to identify has an ID and if that ID is unique on the page. If it is, we can use it in order to uniquely identify that particular element. We can write a CSS selector for this element here. We can see that the ID value is ID module image. So the corresponding CSS selector will be hash and the name of that value. So it's going to be hash ID module image. Using hash in front of an ID is the default way of creating a CSS selector based on ID. So this is kind of a shortcut because, as you will see a bit uh, later, uh, we can specify other attributes, not just the ID, but the syntax will be different. So for IDs, we have a shortcut and whenever we want to create a CSS selector based on an ID, we will just specify hash and the name of the ID or the value of the ID actually. In order to create the corresponding web element, we, in our page object class, will write a at find by annotation where the CSS equals hash and the value of that particular ID. And we will store this result into a web element variable called whatever you want to call it. In this example, it's called element with ID. The class is another attribute that we can use in order to identify an element. Classes are the, let's say, second best thing after an ID. Sometimes a class on an element might be unique on the page. Sometimes uh, the same class will be used on several elements because all of those elements have a common property. Maybe all of those elements have a particular styling or serve a particular functionality. Therefore, in order to use a class to select just the one element, when the element is unique, we can store the result of the selector into a web element. If we have several elements with the same selector, we can store the result of this selector into a list. So first of all, the selector for a class starts with a dot and then with the value of the class. So in my example here, I have a button whose class attribute has a value of W3 button. My selector will be dot w3 dash button. In order to store the result of this selector into a web element, I will just say find by CSS equals dot w3 button and I will store this into a web element. If we're thinking about the example where there is only one attribute of this kind on the page, so only one class whose value is W3 button, it's enough for us to store the result of this selector into a web element. If there are several such classes, the selector will be exactly the same. So we will write at find by and using the same CSS selector, just that we will store the result into a list of web elements. Of course, if we store this result into a list and there is only one element on the page with that class, the size of this list will be one because we will have only one element identified by that selector. So the ID and the class would be the most common and frequently used. But in our experience, we know that we won't necessarily have these uh, attributes to help us. So we could try something else. Uh, first of all, let's see if we have several classes on an element that can help us identify that particular element. So in this example, my button has several classes. And let's say that this is the only element on the page who has all of these classes. In order to identify this element, I could just chain all the classes that the element has. So my selector would be nothing more than dot the first value of that class 
and then dot the second value of that class without any spaces between and so on. So it's basically just a chain of dot and a class value. So this is going to be a bit of a longer selector and the corresponding at find by annotation will say CSS equals and the chain of, uh, of classes and the result will be stored into a web element. Of course, if there are several items on the page with the same selector that we just specified, we can store these into a list. Once we store uh, the result of a selector into a list, we can just obtain any element that we want from that list by using its index. So in Java, in order to, um, to identify or to work with a specific item from the list, you would just have to say name of the list dot get and the index which specifies the position in the list of that element. So if we want to work, let's say, with the second element from the list, we would just need to call the name of the list dot get and one. So if it's the second one, we will say dot get one. If it's the third one, we will say dot get two and so on. There is another way to identify certain elements. Sometimes the, the tag of that element is unique. So let's say that we have a page where there is only one H2 element. In this case, the easiest selector that we can write is just the name of the tag. So we will just specify in our case H2. Nothing uh, in front, nothing after that. This will be very easily written as at find by CSS equals H2, and then we will store this into a web element. Of course, if there are several H2s on the page, we could store this result into a list of web elements. If there are several H2s on the page and we're only interested in the first one, we can choose to just store the result to a web element because how this works. Once the selectors are parsed, if we, don't, if we don't store the result to a list, only the first item will be stored to a variable. So it's basically say, like saying uh, it would be list item dot get zero. So only the first encounter of this tag would be stored into the web element. Keep this in mind. In case we we can only identify uh, our elements based on some other attributes apart from the ID or the class, we can specify what that particular attribute is and what is the value for that attribute. So in this case, let's say that our image is the only one on the page whose width is 189. In this case, our selector will be between square brackets the name of that attribute equals the value. So this means that the web element will have the width exactly 189. Our corresponding web element declaration will be at find by CSS equals square brackets width equals 189. Similarly, if we wanted to work with the height, the selector would have been square brackets height equals 125. So this is very easy. Any attribute that we have can be, um, can be identified with this uh, syntax. Remember I said that the ID and the class are also attributes. We could have said ID equals and the value, but instead of writing something this long, we have the hash, the value of the ID shortcut. So we don't need to specify that we have an ID equals something. In some situations, the attribute values are way too long. So let's say we have an image and we're interested in the source of the image. The source of the image can tell us that that image is uh, unique. However, we don't want to write the entire uh, source or maybe it's the source is domain specific and we don't really know uh, when we're writing the test on which domain we are, we are running that test. Uh, we just we're just interested in that particular attribute to contain a certain value, not to equal that value. In that case, we can write a syntax that says square brackets source star equals 1878. So in this example, we are only interested in that attribute source 
whose value contains 1878. We're not interested in the attribute to actually equal a particular value. And the corresponding at find by uh, declaration will be similar to what we've seen before. We just need to specify that the selector is source star equals 1878. So this is all beautiful if we have certain attributes of an element that we're interested in that will help us uniquely identify that particular element. But in reality, in many situations, our elements do not have any unique properties that we can look at. Therefore, we will need to start writing our selectors based on some ancestors that our elements have. So we need to start looking up in the HTML in order to find the closest ancestor of that particular element that will give us, in combination with the selector of our element, a unique path. And I will show you all kinds of examples in the next slides. Before we start, let's just uh, set a convention so it's easier for us, for us to, to follow these examples. So I'm interested in working with the alpha element. So this will be an HTML element with some tag. In the HTML structure, this alpha element, and I'm just calling it alpha, so you won't see it as alpha in the HTML. In the HTML structure, this alpha element will have some siblings. Siblings are tags that are found at the same level as alpha. As you can see, all of these, the H3, the BR, the alpha, and the div, have the same indentation. The parent of alpha is an A tag you know your, it's, uh, it's a parent because it's shifted to the left. So alpha's parent is A because it's the closest upwards element to alpha and to the left. On the right-hand side, you can also see another example where alpha has a lot of divs as siblings and also has a parent, which is another div. We will call this parent Bravo, and we will go so on and so on. Bravo's parent will be named Charlie. So this is just for example purposes for us to understand it properly. And I will show you how to identify the selectors for alpha on several levels. And I will start with showing you how we can identify the selector on two levels. In this example, the, the element we're interested in is an alpha element whose tag is an h3. But the h3 in this example is not unique on the page. We have several other h3s uh, on the page, and we're only interested in this particular one. If we look at the HTML example that I have here, the h3 tag has a parent. The parent is a div whose ID is level 2. In this example, let's say that this ID is unique on the page. So if we wanted to work with the div, um, the selector for this div would be hash level two because this is the ID. In order to identify the selector for alpha, we will need to identify its first ancestor that has a unique property, which we have already found, and to also specify something about the alpha element. Therefore, our selector will be hash level two, h3. So in order to, to work with the alpha element, we will specify a selector of its parent, which uniquely identifies its parent, and then h3. When this code is evaluated, so when you're running your test and this selector is evaluated in order to identify the web element, it will work as follows. After the first encounter, of an element with ID level 2, in the children of level 2, the first H3 element will be looked for. In our case, there is only one. And so this completes our CSS selector. We don't need anything else. We have found in an ID, so an element with an ID, and then the first and only H3 element, which is a child of this element, will be uh, the element that we're interested in. It will be alpha. So we will store this result into a web element and we can start working with this H3 element. We can maybe 
uh, read its properties and we might need to check that the text in this H3 is of a particular value. Another example where alpha again has an H3 tag but there are other H3s on the page H3 has siblings, so there are other tags on the same level which with H3, and there is also a parent of these siblings, and the parent has a unique ID. In our case, the selector will be exactly the same. So it's going to be the ID of the parent and H3. And that is because the siblings don't matter when this evaluation is done. If you think about it, this selector is evaluated as follows. Find me the first element with this ID, and then among these children, find me the first H3. In our case, there is only one H3, which is a child of this ID. So this will uniquely identify our element on the page. Basically, in this case, when there are no siblings on alpha and when there are siblings on alpha, uh, the, the selector will be exactly the same. Now what happens if alpha has siblings but the siblings are of the same type as alpha? So all of these siblings are H3s. Well, again, alpha doesn't have a unique selector. Its parent does. Its parent has a ID. If we write the same selector as we did before, we will store it into a list and what we will get will be all of the siblings which are the children of the div with this ID. So among those children, among uh, all of the elements of that list, the second element will be our alpha element. You might think that there are um, there is another construct that might be used which is called ant child. But in reality, I am not going to talk about that at all, and I'm not using it and have not been using it for years because instead of saying ant child, it's better to create this list. It's easier to work with a Java list. Also, you don't need to create a new web element for each of these siblings. Using the list will, with one line of code, store several selectors into a list and then based on the position on that list, you can just extract the element you want to work with. So in our case, ID and H3 returns a list of three elements and the element with index one is the alpha element we are interested in. Similarly, if all of the siblings are of the same type, let's say that they are all divs, but the element we're interested in has something that sets it apart from the others, meaning it has a class, we can use that class to write the selector. This class might not be unique on the page. So if it is not, but the parent of alpha has an ID, the easiest way to work with this element, if we're not interested in its siblings whatsoever in our tests, is to say that our selector is the ID of the parent, and then we can specify the class of our alpha element. So again, in this example, all of the children of the parent with the, an ID are of the same tag, but something sets our alpha apart. And in this case, it is a class that can be, again, anywhere else on the page. It's just that within this construct, it's unique. Within this um, set of siblings, it is the only Alpha is the only element that has this particular attribute, this class. So in this example, we can just say the ID of the parent and the class. Notice how the ID is again hash and the name of the ID, and the class is specified as dot and the name of the class. Some particular examples of two level cases that you might see in, in your um, web pages are the unordered list and the ordered list. Think about an unordered list as a bulleted list. So let's say you're displaying something to the user, like maybe, I don't know, some locations from where they can buy something. Those locations might be a list and in order for them to be 
better visible to the customers, they are displayed with bullets. So this is a UL, UL element, unordered list, and all of those bulleted items are uh, specified with a Li tag. So it's a list item. All of these list items are siblings and their parent is a UL tag. In our case, the parent, the UL tag has an ID, but the children of this tag do not have any particular attribute that sets them apart. All of them are just simple leads. In order to, to identify the alpha element we're interested in here, we will actually identify all of the children of the UL element. So in this case, we will specify the ID of the UL element, which is Bravo UL, and then we will specify the tag name of each of these children. So Bravo UL as ID and Lee will return a list of web elements whose size will be three. Now, because we have stored all of these into a list, we can work with any of them. So let's say at one point you want to check that the text on the first element is correct. Then you will have to work with the unordered list um, element, which is the first one and whose index is zero. So then you would just say unordered list dot get zero dot get text equals something something. If you're interested in working with alpha, then you will just say unordered list dot get two and then you will just um, interact with that element as you see fit. Another case of two level uh, uh, elements is an ordered list. So similar to the unordered list, it's just a list of elements that are displayed to the users, but they are numbered. So you will see something like one Zulu, two Yankee, three Alpha. This will be on the web page that you're looking at. Again, we have siblings here who have the same tag, but nothing else that sets them apart. And they're not the only list on the page. So we might have on the same page an ordered list and an ordered list and several other such lists. In order to identify these elements which pertain to a ordered list, we can just create a selector which specifies the ID, which is Bravo OL, and then the Li. So in our case, again, we will store the result of this selector into a list of web elements, which will make the list have three elements. The size of the list will be three. In order to work with alpha, we will just have to say ordered list dot get two, because in Java, the indexes start at zero. So having uh, created this list, we can then maybe check the second element if we're interested in that one at one point. We will just call the list dot get one. So this is what happens when we have two levels. So two levels is pretty simple and it's pretty easy to identify the elements. When the number of level, uh, levels rises, it starts to get a bit more complicated. And we will start with the uh, example where alpha has an H3 tag, but it's not the only H3 tag on the page. It also has a parent, which is a div, but there are many other divs on the page. The div does not have any unique properties in this case. However, the parent of the div, which is another div, has an ID. So this ID will help us identify, first of all, one of the ancestors of alpha. Then based on the element, which is this ancestor of alpha, we will identify alpha by saying the first H3 encountered as a child of the element with ID level three is our element and we will store it into a web element. So in this case, uh, when we need to identify the selector, we will go from the lower level to an upper level we will start looking at ancestors of the element we're interested in. When the selector is being parsed in our tests, it will be top down. So the first encounter of this element, so the first encounter of an element with the ID level three 
will make the search proceed in our in the children of this element so all of these children will be looked at and the first h3 will be encountered which in our case will be the alpha element and uh, we will store this to a web element and we will work with this one here we have a similar example only this time hang on only this time we have a div which is a div with an id then we have another div and another div so basically here we have three items which are all children of themselves and then uh, one of them has an id and one of them has a class this class let's say that is not unique on the page but the id is so in this case what we're going to do is we're going to say that the selector for alpha is going to be the id and then we will specify the class that alpha has we are not interested in the intermediate div this does not bring any sort of value for uh, evaluating this expression we could have said id div and the class but we don't need this intermediate div it doesn't bring any sort of information we're looking again at this selector here in blue so when this is evaluated it says find me the first element with this id and then find me the first child of this element that has this particular class and that is enough to identify alpha and because we have written this particular selector we will store it into a web element because this will guarantee that the element is unique it's the only element with this class in the ancestor um, in the children of the element with the id another example is when we have alpha who has siblings of the same type alpha and the siblings parent is only a div which doesn't have any unique properties that can set it apart from others but the ancestor of this div has an id in this case similar to what we had initially in the first uh, three level example our selector will be the id of the ancestor with an id and then h3 this time however because alpha is the second element here in this list of h3s we will store the result of this uh, selector into a list this way we can access any of these three elements that we need whenever we need them and the selector will be really short we don't need to specify the intermediate div again because as i mentioned when the css selector will be parsed we are interested that uh, in the fact that we have an id and then that all of that there are some children of this id who have this tag h3 so in this example we're only interested in this level where the id is and the tag of the h3 the list will have three elements so it's very important to remember that the list has three elements here this is another example where we're interested in alpha again alpha has a parent which is a div and this parent of alpha let's call it bravo also has siblings which look exactly like bravo so we have uh, an id on a ancestor which is a div this ancestor has three three children a div another div and another div and each of these children have an h3 child so basically this is a let's say grandparent with three children and each child has one child in order to create a selector for this particular example again we are not interested in any of these intermediate divs they do not bring any relevant information for identifying alpha or its siblings like zulu and yankee to create the selector for this particular example we will just specify the id of the grandpa let's say 
and the H3 tag. In this case, we will, re we will uh, receive three elements. The first element here will be Zulu, the second one will be Alpha. So our list of web elements will have Zulu as get zero when called on that list and alpha as get one when called on that list. Again, because we have Java indexes here. So again, even, this, even in this example, the fact that we had three divs here without any sort of identifying information didn't help us, but it didn't bother us either because we had another parent with a unique property and we just eliminated these nodes that we were not interested in. Again, the size of the list was three. In this particular example, it gets even more interesting because here all of the children and all of the children of the children have the same tag. All of them are divs. Now in this case, if we specified the ID and only div afterwards, we would have gotten a list of six elements. But we don't want that. We don't want to have six elements because those six would have been this div, this div, this div, this div, this, and this. So three out of six elements are of no interest to us. Therefore, in order to identify only Zulu, Alpha, and Yankee, our selector will be the ID, div, div. This way, the list will have only three elements. And again, alpha will be the element whose index is one. So remember that in this example where we have an ID and all of the children and the children's children have the same ID, we will need to specify a little bit more than just an ID and another tag. Here, we need to specify both div tags because otherwise we will get too many elements and some of them we are not even interested in. And this goes on for n levels. So if we have, let's say, 100 levels or 200 levels where we have, for example, an H3 and many ancestors who are just divs, but they do not have any class or any other property that can um, kind of set it apart in this construct, we will just specify that the alpha element can be selected by the ID and then the H3. So this is just a generaliz generalization of the particular two and three level cases that we have looked at before. Similarly, if we have an element and there is an ancestor which is a little bit different from the other ancestors, so in this case I just put a span here, but all of the other elements are of the same type and divs, this span can help us shorten uh, or easily uh, identify this div because as you can see this is also a div. So in order not to write div 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 div, our selector will be the ID, the span and the div. So we are eliminating all of the divs that are above the span here because they are not bringing any useful information However, this span does. So when this uh, selector will be identified, it will be, or evaluated, it will say, find me the children or the first child of level NID, which is a span, which is here, and then find me the div child of that span. And in our case, this is alpha. What happens if we have an element in a list. So we have identified a selector. We know that the element is in a list of selectors. We know that it is in a list of web elements, but we don't know on which position in that list that element is found. What we can do is we can store the result of the CSS selector into a list of web elements. And if we know the text of the element we're interested in, then we can just say for web element, so we're going to iterate the list and, and once we find an element whose text equals the expected one, that is the element we want to work with. We can just say element.click, let's say. So if we don't know the position in the list of an element, but we know that it's there, maybe the items in the list are generated randomly each time uh, the page loads, then we can just search for that element 
based on a text. We will specify a selector which will commonly identify uh, different siblings. So the selector will identify more than just one element, but all of those elements will be siblings of our element. And then we will just be interested in the text on that element. Another example where we can use this approach is the one here where we only have, let's say that this is all our page, so we don't have anything else on the page. We just have five divs and we're only interested in alpha. We don't know where alpha is every time. So we will just say, find me the CSS selector div. And then for that element whose text equals alpha, we will just do something. This is also valid if we have several. Uh, so it, this is the example where we don't really have any sort of uh, way of identifying that element. There is nothing on that element. We don't have any attributes. There is absolutely nothing else. In this case, we will just say, give me all the divs on the page and just look for the one whose text equals alpha. Just keep in mind that this approach might give you a very, very large list. So you might have maybe a thousand elements uh, on the uh, stored in your list. And if you have that many elements, it will just be really difficult to work with them because uh, the amount of time it takes for that list to be uh, rendered and processed is going to be huge. So try to be as specific as possible and try to find some unique properties in order to identify those elements. So these are all the examples that uh, I will go over during this webinar. You can see all the examples that I've shown in my GitHub project. You can see the tests. So I actually have tests that you can run. And uh, there's also the HTML uh, that you can take a look at that I've shown here. Uh, just check out these links and you can take a look at the selectors that I've written, which are these from this example, but there are a few extra ones. Uh, run the test inspect the HTML. So uh, just, you know, you can perform further research uh, on this topic. And also don't forget that Test Automation University also has a dedicated course regarding selectors and strategies for selectors. Thank you very much. I am done for now. And I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, we do have some time and we have a lot of questions. I'm just not sure that we'll get through all of them, but we'll try. Um, so first one, what strategy do you use to pierce a shadow DOM or multiple levels of shadow DOM to actually get the attributes? Mm, I'm, not sh I'm not familiar with shadow DOM, so I'm not really sure what this question refers to. But um, yeah, I will, I will look at it and maybe I will, uh, I will reply on Twitter or, or on LinkedIn afterwards. Great. Next question. How efficient is CSS locator when compared to others? Because uh, we th I think we can do the same things using other selectors. Is that correct? Yes. In general, you can write the same thing using XPath, for example. The problem in XPath is uh, many times it can be really brittle. Um, sometimes you need to specify some more, let's say, nodes in the HTML than you need to specify in CSS. So that makes certain XPath selectors more fragile, whereas CSS can be more reliable. There's, I don't have any, um, let's say, proof that um, any particular type of selector is better or faster than the other one. I know that people have said that, for example, finding elements directly by ID might be faster than by selector. In my experience, in having run a lot of tests during so many years, I can't really say that I've seen any sort of difference uh, between them. And also, I'm only writing CSS selectors because I want to be consistent in my page. So even if I write IDs, I will use the CSS selector uh, syntax because I want all of my items in the page object class to, let's say, look the same. So they will all have CSS selectors just to be consistent. Uh, how can we work with alpha element if the ID level two is not unique? Well, if the level two element is not unique, then you can just go up, 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 up. So the whole thing is, the whole idea here is to go up 
until you find the first um, the first ancestor that has a unique property. It might be an ID, it might be something else. So I just mentioned ID as an example. It might be that uh, one of the ancestors is a tag that is nowhere else on the page, or it can have a class that is nowhere uh, nowhere else on the page, and so on and so on. So um, the, the, the whole secret here is to just go up until you find the first uh, the first element that you can uniquely identify based on uh, what I showed initially. So ID, class, some attributes, and so on. Yeah. Can this be used with Python? Sorry, with what? With Python. Python. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, uh, the selectors themselves are just uh, let's say they are separate from Java, so the selectors are not part of Java. Um, I haven't tried Python, to be honest, but uh, there would be no reason to not use them. Uh, the only difference would be that uh, the syntax of Python is different in a sense that uh, the way you store your variables is different than what you do in, in Java. So I do believe selectors can be the same across any language that you're using. Can you please clarify when to use H3 versus when to use div? Uh, H3 and divs were just examples. So these are tags in your code. Uh, you need to look at your page and you need to look at the elements that you're working with. I've just created H3 and divs because those were really easy to work with. I could have said image or something else, but uh, these are shorter to write, so they don't have that many properties. It was just it was just for example purposes. Consider H3 any element you have on your page and div any element that you have on your page. Just generalize what I've shown you today. The only thing you need to consider is that you have certain attributes on each of these elements. You have the general attributes, which are ID, class, name, and I don't know which ones. And then you have some specific attributes that are only present on some elements. So let's say if you have an image, um, you will have href, which is only, sorry, not href, uh, source, which is unique to an image. So a link will not have a source because it will have an href attribute and so on. So based on the elements you need to identify, it doesn't matter what they are, just look at their properties, at their attributes. That's what's important. How will you create CSS selectors for pages that have dynamic elements? Um, dynamic elements, yeah. So um, ideally, even though they are dynamic, you know what their tag will be. So you know that when they will pop up, let's say, um, they will have a specific tag. You just need to know where they will be. Once you've managed to trigger them being displayed, you can call the web elements and you can interact with the web elements. You can write the selectors before those elements are there because how this page object uh, and page factory that I've shown earlier work is that you can have a class where you have created all of your web elements and they don't need to be present on the page when you start your test. They only need to be present on the page when you want to interact with them. So let's say that you have this dynamic element that only appears after, let's say, a value from the dropdown was selected. You will initialize your page. Uh, you will call the page factory init elements uh, um, method that I've shown earlier that you can actually see in the recording. And then you will only need to have that element there once you want to say, like assert true that the element was displayed or that the element has some property or something like that. It doesn't need to be on the page un until you interact with it. And you can create the selectors before they are present on the page if you are using this approach. So I, this, this kind of answers the question. So we got a lot of questions about XPath versus selectors and uh, locators. And I just wanted to know if, uh, your opinions about pros and cons of both systems? Yeah, I, I, there's, I can't really say that there is a, a pro and con, apart from the fact that I find that certain XPath selectors are quite brittle. So many people have said that um, they won't use CSS selectors because uh, if the HTML changes, uh, these selectors break. And from my experience, that is more the case of XPath selectors than CSS. 
because as I've shown you in CSS, uh, you don't need to specify so many intermediate nodes. So the page can change quite a lot between, let's say, where we had three levels, right? So let's say that instead of three levels, the developer decides that we need to have a hundred more levels, but all of them are, let's say, elements that we're not interested in, right? So the first unique uh, ancestor is a, let's say, I don't know, a div. Our H3 element is our alpha, and in between there are, let's say, a lot of spans. We, we're not interested in those new spans that were added by the developer because we still are only interested in the ID of the div and the H3. So there are so many changes that can come to the page which will not break the CSS selector but will break a corresponding XPath selector. So from my perspective, from my work with CSS selectors, I have always had really short selectors, really clean, let's say, selectors. They are you know, way easier to read. And I didn't have to change them as much as I used to change my expat selectors. So yeah, that's that's kind of my opinion. What happens if items will be added in time and you want to limit the amount of changes you make into your tests and the way that you select and check the values? Mm, so if new elements are added, uh, that only impacts you if uh, they change the structure in a sense that your selector is not working anymore. Um, or if you have a list and some other elements are added to that list, which, which makes the list uh, uh, way too large, let's say, then you probably need to spend a little more effort investigating, you know, maybe um, to change the selector that you wrote initially, or a very you know a very easy thing would be to talk to the developers and of course this would be ideal talk to the developers and kindly ask them to to change the structure or to to make it so that uh, the application is you know testable so that you don't need to make many changes in your tests ideally that would happen there are many situations where developers are in the same team with the testers and they can easily consult when they introduce new elements if that's not possible, um, you just need to, to, you know, take it, you know, on a on a case by case uh, situation. It depends on how the changes are implemented and what the changes are, honestly. So I can't really say for sure what would be the solution, but I think the first thing would be talk to the developer and only if that doesn't help, you know, try to figure out some kind of workaround. Uh, um, regarding level four selectors such as has and contains, are there any good packages for Java to be able to use them with Selenium? Um, has and contains, I'm not sure what the question refers to, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, we'll take we'll take one last question since we are out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, besides running the code, is there any better way to test the CSS selectors of a web element? Um, yeah, I, I got this question earlier at one point, if there are any tools that can validate the selector. Honestly, I don't know of any. So uh, I think what you can do is just trial and error. That is what I do. But um, if you take a look of, at these slides and if you take a look at these examples, it will be way easier for you to actually write the selectors in time because you kind of get a, an, an automation like, um, let's say, thought process. Once you will see a page, once, once you will see an HTML, it will come more natural to you to easily identify, you know, um, that these elements should be stored into a list, that this, um, in this case, I just need to go up, up, up until I find a, a unique ancestor and so on. Honestly, personally, I don't know of a, of a better way. I'm sorry. Okay, so unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, I just wanted to mention to everyone, before I will let Corinna to, uh, say goodbye to all of you, I just wanted to mention I saw all your thank you notes uh, to Corinna, and I promise that she will receive all of them. Uh, after this session, I will email her uh, all your questions, all your thank you notes, so everything. So if you have anything else to say, please uh, use this time uh, and, and send it in the questions panel. I want to thank everyone that joined us for this live session. And of course, uh, a special thanks to our guest speaker,
Corinna for this wonderful and in-depth presentation. Her course on Test Automation University is coming out this September, so definitely look out for that. And I'm just going to remind you that the link to the recording of this session with Corinna's slide deck will be emailed to you tomorrow by end of day. And I hope to see you all at our next event. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. And I really hope this was useful for you and you will start practicing a little bit with the with what I've shown you. So thank you very much and have a good day and a good week. Bye.